Very good afternoon. Welcome you all in this uh, session of this diabetic retinopathy and the medical retina. Now I request Dr. Shankar Shubhra Chaudhary to present. Uh, is there? A very good afternoon to respected uh, judges and the, the delegates present over here. I am Sankar Subra Chaudhuri, here to present a cross-sectional comparative study of the outer retinal layer thickness in newly diagnosed patients with hyperthyroidism. Uh, greetings from RIO Kolkata. Now we all know that thyroid hormone is uh, responsible for growth, differentiation, maturation, as well as apoptosis of a normal cell. So it also is responsible for the growth maturation of the rods and cones within the photoreceptor cells. Now, if a thyroid hormone uh, is expressed morally, then there is uh, excessive, uh, leads to excessive photoreceptor both in healthy and disease retina, whereas suppressing the thyroid hormone, there is a preservation of the cones and cone cells. And this has been well established in a study published by Ma, Ma et al., uh, which has shown that in liver's congenital amaurosis and in case of achromatopsia in mice models, if there is a suppression of the thyroid hormones, then there is a preservation of cones. And this study has been the basis for my study. So the objective of my study was to assess the thickness of the photoreceptor outer and the inner segments in the newly diagnosed hyperthyroid patients and compare it with the normal population. Now this is the first kind of study ever done on human eyes. All the previous studies were mice models only. So this was a cross-sectional randomized uh, study over a six months period in which 40 normal patients, normal healthy individuals were selected and 40 newly diagnosed hyperthyroid patients were selected in which visual acuity con uh, and col color contrast vision was taken followed by a dilated fundoscopy and they were then subjected to Heidelberg uh, spectral society. The results we found that uh, in normal uh, population, 31 were female out of the 40, whereas in hyperthyroid patients, 33 were female. The mean uh, thickness of the outer nuclear layer and the uh, photoreceptor inner segment layer was 77.98 micron, whereas the thickness of the uh, pigmented outer segment was 39.65 micron. Now in cases of the hyperthyroid patients, the thickness of the outer nuclear layer and the pigmented inner segment layer decreased from 77 micron to 71.83 micron, whereas the thickness of the pigmented outer segment decreased from 39 micron to 33.45 micron in case of the hyperthyroid patients. Now in the group statistics, this decrease was significant as we can see uh, after the uh, student's PRT test. So the cone photoreceptors of the vertebrate retina mediate daylight vision, and these cones are, we all know are responsible for uh, central acuity of vision, color, and contrast, uh, contrast vision. Now, uh, though although the thyroid hormone signaling plays a major role in cone opsin expression and patterning, but a study by Lou et al. showed that TA, suppressing the TA signaling has no effect on the rod and cone structures. Whereas uh, Glasky et al. also showed that the suppressing of the thyroid hormone, there has been a thinning of the retinal photoreceptors in your study as we have found in our study. But the limitation of our study was a small sample size. The hypothyroid patients were not considered in our study and only anatomical assessment, that is the thickness was done. But a physiological assessment, that a, whether there is a color or contrast vision change would have been a better study. So the technique message is that since cones play a significant role in maintaining a good vision, a thinning of the photoreceptors layers may be responsible for the reduction in contrast sensitivity as well. So there is an early detection uh, of change, early detection in the changes of the retinal thyroid, uh, retinal layers in case of a hyperthyroid patients may guide the physician to prevent significant uh, vision problems. And another most important thing is if we, whenever we can see there is a thinning of the photoreceptors, a differential of hyperthyroidism should be made. These are my differences. Thank you. Thank you. You have finished it uh, in time. But my question is, uh, what is the basic significance? Why did you uh, do that study? So because of all the previous studies were in mice models. Yeah. 
and they have shown that uh, in cases of hyper, both in the cases of hyperthyroidism, there are studies on hyperthyroidism with mice models and hypothyroidism. Mainly the study, there is one significant study in mice models uh, with uh, induced uh, levers congenital amyloidosis, uh, levers uh, LC and uh, acromatopsia, which they have uh, showed that if there is a suppressing of thyroid hormone signaling, the cone functions with LC and acromatopsia has been developed. So they have actually gained colored uh, contrast vision for them. So this has been a basis for my study, which I'm just shown mm -hmm. that if anyhow we can modify so the thyroid are the hormone. patients uh, treated for thyroid uh, disease or not? For the mice models, they have been treated with thyroid, and th both thyroid suppressants were given, and, and, and CC agonists were also given. Okay. No human so study has ever been done. No, no. Uh, what is the result for that in the mice study? My study, uh, there is shown that with LC and with uh, acromatopsia, uh -huh. the cone function has been bettered. Okay. You are, uh, you have, uh, you are uh, telling that in any patients with the photoreceptor, uh, abnormality, you should think about thyroid. That was one line. Uh, one differential one should, should, be, should be considered. That is far-fetched because yours is a small group. Huh. And you get every CSR or every patient, you will get a photo. No, sir. I, I, am, I will not. <laughs> for yeah. CSR, there is obvi obviously yeah, the diagnosis of CSR or for CNVM. Yeah. But yeah. if we can see the, or less there is healthy retina, I just there is a. All other uh, uh, diseases like CSR, everything, when you include it in the study. No, sir. Ah, so that is a big uh, bias. Hmm. Any other question? Huh? Any other question? Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Now I call upon Dr. Besali Vishwas. He will, she will be speaking on the incidence of peripheral neuropathy and its effect in the severity of retinopathy in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients. Hello everyone. Today my topic is incidence of peripheral neuropathy and its effect in the severity of retinopathy in type 2 diabetes patient. We know world, worldwide diabetes is a burden. Around 537 million people are there. And in India also, it is around 101 million according to the study. And diabetic retinopathy is one of the major uh, uh, leading cause of blindness worldwide. So uh, we know that diabetes causes a sequential of complications starting from neuropathy, then retinopathy, and then nephropathy. And diabetic peripheral neuropathy, we can found in uh, patients of even in the impaired glucose tolerance state. And uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thinning is a neuropathy. So in this study, we have studied the peripheral neuropathy and also the retinal nerve fiber layer thinning in peripapillary region. So aim of our study is uh, to estimate the incidence of peripher peripheral neuropathy among patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus, mellitus and to determine its role as a risk factor for presence and severity of diabetic retinopathy. We have studied uh, for a period of starting from January 2021 till uh, June 22. It is an observational cross-sectional study, and we have three groups. One is control group of 50, case total 100. Uh, within, within it, there is DM without DR 50 and DM with DR 50. We have done uh, many investigations. Among them, uh, two specific investigations are nerve conduction velocity, and another is OCT for RNFL study. We have some inclusion criteria within, uh, within it. We have only included the patients who have suffered for diabetes less than 10 years. And uh, age, we have uh, age limit of uh, 35 to uh, 70 years. And patients who give prior consent and with clear refractive media. And patient, uh, we have excluded the patient who have suffered from acute complication of diabetes, non-diabetic renal disease, other uh, cardiological disorders, uh, glaucoma, uveitis, ocular hypertensions, and moderate to severe PDR. Then we have done the statistical analysis, and we get the results. So here are the results. We get the result that motor nerve, upper limb, and even the lower limb 
latency was increased in both the group, second, that is DM without deer and DM with deer. In the third group, that is DM with deer, the uh, latency was increased more. And when the amplitude, the amplitude was decreased in second group and third group, that is DM without deer and DM with deer. But the more decrease of amplitude was present in DM with deer group. Uh, this was also the same result we have found in sensory nerve upper limb and lower limb, both in latency and amplitude. Another uh, result we found that OCT, RNFL, peripapillary uh, layer thickness was thinned out in both the groups, that is DM without deer and DM with deer. But the thinning was more in the third group. Even the thick thickness was around uh, 63 to 72 micrometer uh, in this range. So we can conclude here that we have, uh, uh, we have found some uh, positive correlation between decrease in peripheral nerve conduction velocity with increased severity of diabetic retinopathy and another positive correlation between decrease in OCT RNFL thickness with increased severity of diabetic retinopathy. So we can conclude that both the peripheral nerve conduction velocity and OCT RNFL can be used as a marker for prediction of early neurodegeneration in diabetic retinopathy, diabetic patients, sorry. And we have some limitations. Uh, I have a small sample size and this is single center study. There was always a hospital bias and it was a COVID pandemic period. So I cannot include the diabetic nephropathy patients these are all my references. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, so did you do OCT RNFL in all the cases? Yes, sir. Uh, in control group and even case. Uh, all diabetic cases. retinopathy and without also. Without, right, right sir. Right. So uh, you uh, found out uh, the difference in the, the thickness in the RNFL. Right, sir. And, uh, I have taken the average values right. of uh, four quadrant. Right, right. A good study. Thank you, sir. What is the clinical implication? Uh, sir, uh, we can uh, use the OCT RNFL thickness and uh, nerve conduction velocity as a marker, right? Uh, uh, even in the impaired glucose tolerance state of diabetes early state of diabetes. But uh, both are confounding factors, right? That neuropathy and uh, uh, retinopathy. Right. Both are related to the duration of the diabetes usually. Yes, and sir. Uh, latent diabetic patients will not have a neuropathy problem. Uh, Do you have, I mean, any data? Uh, latent diabetes, not undiagnosed diabetes, have a neuropathy problem with the delayed uh, nerve conduction velocity? So if such a thing is there, probably your study has a role. Otherwise, uh, both are confounding factors, neuropathy and retinopathy. Yes. That's what I think. Excellent presentation, Dr. Bashali. Now I thank, thank you. you. Now I request Dr. Brijesh Thakkar for the presentation. Shall I begin? Yes. Good afternoon. It's a hot environment. Let me try to cool it a bit. So I'm Rajesh from Hyderabad, and these are my disclosures. The, this study is actually funded by Ali Prasad Eye Hospital funding mechanisms. The acknowledgments are right there. So why am I looking for alternative avenues to stop diabetic retinopathy? The fact being that there is metabolic memory which is going on and on in our body. The census in our country showing that most of the Indians don't know that they have diabetes, and if they know they have diabetes, it's not controlled. The fact that we have only invasive therapy for diabetic retinopathy, the fact that we do not have a secondary level prevention for diabetic retinopathy, and we still have a high rate of sight threatening diabetic retinopathy in Asia, after everything done, we need to look for something else. And why I chose microbiome, the fact being that it is something which can be offered as a non-invasive therapy to our patients. So why to look at the gut? So we started look at, looking at the gut, we looked and we looked, if you can see my cursor, we looked at rats, we looked at humans, we drew these heat maps, we showed that the people with diabetic retinopathy, they seem to cluster together, they seem to come together, they have a different kind of microbiome in their gut as compared to healthy controls or diabetic, diabetic people with DM without DR. 
But what is the link? So here I took the help of my fellows and we started looking at what are the possible mechanisms, why the gut, why the eye, how come they are linked together. We chouted out these six, seven mechanisms, we chouted out a detailed biomolecular mechanisms and we started believing that yes, it is possible. But if it is possible, what is there inside the eye, which is a research question that I come up with here today. And we started looking whether there is an evidence of microbiome there inside the eye as well. So this was a pilot study in itself, uh, not done before. And we included people who were undergoing cataract surgery. And uh, we took out their aqueous, we ruled out signs of open globe injury, signs of intravital injections, anything which could have introduced a microbiome inside the eye, we tried to exclude it. We screened 22 people, we included 17, and we analyzed 12 people as we lost some of, some of the samples which were not amenable to laboratory analysis. We balanced out these people in terms of their diet using the help of United Kingdom Diabetes Mellitus Questionnaire. We, uh, we put this across, uh, across the laboratory. We uh, took out the microbiome DNA. We removed the human DNA. We did amplification of the DNA of the microbiome. Then we sequenced it using techniques known as next generation sequencing. And then we finally came out with the fact that these are the microorganisms which are actually present. After that, for a quality check, we did negative controls. We made a very rigorous sample, uh, sample collection. We drew rarefaction curves. This is a rarefaction curve, which is very typical of any microbiome, which tells you that the study was done with good amount of quality. So these are the results. So what are the results? These four people with DR, they came together again. This red thing shows that these particular organisms over here were actually absent in DR. Whereas people with healthy control and DM, they had some kind of a mixed result. So we started looking at each and every relative abundance of each and every organism differently. So this table shows healthy control versus DM. This table shows healthy control versus DR. This one shows DM versus DR. Look at the amount of organisms which were different in DM versus DR. So this is what told us that relative abundance in DR has a very wide gap as compared to DM and healthy control. And we realized that all these bacteria which were seemingly absent were actually anti-inflammatory in nature. This anti-inflammatory in nature is accounted for by the databases which are available for any microbe all over the world. Any study has limitations. This is not, this world is not perfect. This room is definitely not perfect for the environment. But our study had limitations too. It was done hand in hand with COVID. We could not account for age and alcohol intake. We could uh, stop only at metataxonomy. There are better ways of uh, doing sequencing. We had a low sample size. Again, pilot study is always right and always wrong, but we did have some strengths also. These strengths were the rigor which was, uh, which went in sample in sampling techniques so much so that the patient who underwent cataract surgery were again seen by me just to make sure what amount of retinopathy they had. And then only a single person was involved in all kind of procedures that were done in this study. And with this, finally, we concluded that all eyes, including all of us over here, the judges, the people, the people managing the AV systems, we have some kind of a microbiome there inside our eye. The aqueous humor dysbiosis is distinct in gut microbiome as compared to the aqueous microbiome. And the aqueous humor of people with DR has some unique genera. Where this, this leads us? This led us to beginning up a pan-India study across 17 states of India with a feasibility pan, uh, pilot sample size of 500, which is currently going on. We have reached 350 samples right now. And we are looking towards finding both biomarkers as well as a preliminary therapy towards stopping diabetic retinopathy. Thank you for the patient hearing in the hot environment. Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, do you want to publish it? It is published. I showed in the second slide, I think. OK. Sorry, I missed it. Yeah, it's published. Then you can publish in the No, I cannot take award. I can okay. present. Uh, you can okay. I just wanted to share my data. Hmm. That's OK. And then the preoperative uh, antibodies used for catastrophe, will it affect the microbiome? So we uh, do not use preoperative uh, antibiotics. We just use topical beta dean just before the catastrophe surgery. That is the protocol. No. And nothing else, sir. Uh, you said uh, uh, there was a different microbiome in DR cases. So, uh, uh, which could probably be uh, inflammatory. So in DR, it was anti-inflammatory, sir. Right, right. The people uh, who had DR, yeah. they had loss of anti-inflammatory microorganisms. Correct. Non so, 
how how do you say that uh, those were anti-inflammatory? Yeah, so this is uh, from the database of the organism, which is here, there, everywhere, mm -hmm. but not inside the eye. The function of all the microorganisms inside the eye is never tested. Yeah. So to do that, we are doing this next study. So we are looking for you know RNA transcriptomics. We are looking for metabolites inside the eye to say that no, yeah. we found this. But just to say that my hair is over it does not mean that I, I committed the murder. Yeah. There has to be some evidence between my hair and the murder. So we are trying to look for those things. Yeah. So this comes uh, good, I think, uh, with uh, something like probiotic, something we put yes, sir. you can put on a diabetic account. Yes, sir. More than that, if we feed our mothers with good things, the three generations next may not have diabetic retinopathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really, it's a nice presentation. Thank you. Hats off to you. It's a very nice and a very informative uh, presentation. Now I request Dr. Aruna IC. the presentation. Uh, your topic is an analytical uh, study on inner retinal layers thickness in the type 1 diabetes without retinopathy. Yes, sir. Good afternoon one and all. I am Dr. Aruna, postgraduate from uh, Madurai Medical College, Tamil Nadu. Here I am presenting on an analytical study on inner retinal layer thickness in type 1 diabetics without retinopathy. As we all know that diabetic retinopathy is one of the leading causes of visual impairment and preventable blindness. It is one of the microvascular complications associated with type 1 diabetes. Initially, the etiology of diabetic retinopathy is solely attributed to the microvascular changes. However, a new pathophysiological model has become accepted over the past decade, emphasizing that neurodegeneration is an important and early component of the retinopathy. Aim of my study was to analyze the differences in the retinal thickness in patients with type 1 diabetes without retinopathy and healthy using spectral domain OCT. Hypothesis is there is a relative thinning in RNFL and GCC thickness in type 1 diabetic patients as compared to the normal age-matched individuals. The objective was to determine whether undetectable early morphological and neurological changes are present in patients with type 1 diabetes without retinopathy using uh, spectral domain OCT and to determine a correlation between glycosylated hemoglobin levels and inner retinal layer thickness in type 1 diabetes to demonstrate a relationship between the age of onset, duration of type 1 diabetes to the RNFL and GCC thickness. Duration of this study was 6 months and it was a comparative cross-sectional study. Sample size was 75 type 1 diabetic patients and 75 age-matched controls. Study population 18 to 45 years of age attending outpatient department of ophthalmology, Government Rajaji Hospital, Madurai. Uh, results and analysis. The uh, table on the right shows the distribution based on the age, the mean of 29.32 in diabetic group and mean of 30.12 in non-diabetic group was noted, which was not significant, statistically is not significant. And on the left, there uh, it is the uh, table uh, uh, shows the distribution based on the gender. There was equal distribution among the diabetic and the control group and it is also not statistically significant. Uh, this table shows the comparison of BMI in both groups that BMI in type 1 diabetic patients was significantly lower than that of the normal population. Based on this BMI, the group study group was classified into three groups and the mean RNFL and the GCC thickness was calculated. The mean RNFL thickness showed a significant statistical correlation with the BMI with RNFL thinning noted in people with subnormal BMI with most of the subnormal BMI belongs to the diabetic patient and also, the GCC thinning noted in uh, people with subnormal BMI. Uh, this uh, chart shows the comparison of HbA1c value with RNFL and GCC thickness. Uh, uh, based on the HbA1c value, the study group was classified into four, normal, pre-diabetic, diabetic and uh, uncontrolled diabetic. Uh, from this, it was uh, shown that the uh, diabetic and pre-diabetic groups have uh, thinning in the RNFL and GCC. Uh, based on this comparison between the average RNFL and GCC thickness with the duration of type 1 diabetes, the patient with the more than 20 years of diabetes uh, shows the thinning in the inner retinal layer. This table shows the comparison between average RNFL and GCC thickness in both groups. The inner retinal layer thinning was noted in diabetic population. 
uh, this chart shows the comparison of our average RNFL and JCC thickness in both groups. Uh, uh, in this, uh, the diabetic patients have thinning in both the RNFL and GCC, uh, GCC thickness. Correlation, there was a significant good correlation with the HbA1c value and the retinal layer thickness and a very low negative correlation between uh, diabetic uh, duration and retinal layer thickness. Conclusion of my study was there is significantly significant thinning noted in the peripapillary and the GCC thickness in type 1 diabetic patients without retinopathy when compared to normal population. Hence, the suggested hypothesis was proved which further denotes that there is neurodegeneration happening prior to the microvascular changes and diabetic retinopathy. The inner retinal layer thickness was reduced in patients with poor glycemic control and larger the duration of diabetes, more was the amount of thinning noted in the retinal layers. Thank you. Yes, sir. It was one of my limitation of the studies, sir. Yes, sir. Duration of my study also very less, sir. so we took only. Yes, sir. It was one of my limitation of my study. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Any other question? It's a good presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now I will. I now am call, calling upon Dr. Ajay Durani. He will be speaking on a study of correlation between severity of CSCR and severity of association psychiatric disorders. Thank you very much. So this is a study which I'm uh, ongoing since long time. So we know what is CSR. It's an idiopathic neurosensory retinal detachment affects young males commonly in type A personality, corticosteroid use, and psychosocial disorders like depression and anxiety is seen in these patients. And the treatment, we know it's a, usually a self-resolving condition. It requires laser or PDT in most of the cases. This was our study which was published in which we did a psychiatric evaluation of patients with CSR in Asian Indians. And we found that, you know, in these treatment knife CSR patients, almost 77% had mixed anxiety disorders, 12 had adjustment disorders, and the rest they had major depressive disorders. So this was a prospective double-blind trial which we had done. So. After that, we uh, you know, took this to the next level and we thought ki that you know, they were treated with anxiolytics by the psychiatrist and we found that the resolution with either etizolam or acetoplarozam, uh, which is a SSRI inhibitor, led to a rapid resolution of the fluid. Normally, the fluid resolves in about two to three months and we had a resolution in almost a month in these patients. So this is the hypothesis which was initially proven by, uh, was discussed by Yanuzi that you know, stress leads to in increased glucocorticosteroids which leads to CSR. And so the young population, typically the you know, type A personality, and there's maybe there's increased norepinephrine and sympathetic response, which leads to a pachychoroid also, and that's why PDT works in these patients. So this is the uh, basic etiopathogenesis, which was discussed by Yanuzi et al. And the other theory is the vortex when uh, increased congestion. So this was a study of the correlation of the severity of CSR and the severity of the associated psychiatric disorder. This is the second part of the first study which we published. So this we did. The uh, study of the socioeconomic profile of the patients and their DAS scores. You know, the DAS score compares the the anxiety, stress, and depression score, which is done. It's a it's a sort of a questionnaire which we give to the 33 patients which we had, and we had 33 controls in this. Over two years, we did this in young patients who presented to the OPD with CSR. After thorough examination and FFA OCT, a DAS scoring was done, which is a you know, you give a questionnaire to the patient and he responds to that, you know, saying whether it, it was it was discovered by Lowy Bond et al. in 1995. There is a three self-reporting scales of depression, anxiety, and stress. And they can again be classified into the gradations, you know, from zero to three. So the patient will decide, you know, depending on how he feels. It's a personalized sort of a questionnaire which we give to the patients. So the results which we had in this group of patients, which we saw that the most affected was the socioeconomic upper lower class, you know, means like the, not the totally lower class, the middle class, what you can say, the, you know, the, 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 the uh, middle class of the patients who were economically not very bad off. The acute cases in younger age group, while chronic cases were more seen in the elder age group. Psychiatric morbidity was significantly associated almost 60% of the patients with a P significant value. 
and a higher score of dash significantly with a larger area of associated detachment which we saw. So this is a graph which is showing you the CSR patients are in blue and the controls are in brown. So you can see that the, the, the severity of the psychiatric disorder was seen more in the patients with the CSR group. And the area of the CSR subretinal fluid also was associated with the severity of the psychiatric morbidity which was seen. You know, these, these are the different sizes of the fluid, small, medium, and large. So this is the detailed psychiatric evaluation also was done as a follow-up of this after the DAS study. And this was the basic detailed diagnosis which was done. So the, the psychiatric OPD was also blind to what the patients had, you know. They were just sent for this. So this is few of my cases which I want to show you, you know, which showed a rapid response after treatment by the psychiatrist with anxiolytic drugs, you know, and the rapid resolution of these cases. This is the second case. And normally we get resolution like this patient had extensive subretinal fibrin, as you can see, but there is flattening. It's not that all patients resolved. Some of the patients did require PDT in chronic cases of CSR. And here you can again see that there is even, you know, resolution of fluid after some time with these patients having constant therapy with anxiolytics. This is a patient, again, a 40-year-old man with CSCR with pachychoroid disorder, and he's remained flat with anxiolytics. But some patients don't necessarily fl uh, flatten totally, and there's always a shallow, irregular retinal pigment epithelial detachment. Sometimes it's seen in these patients. This is another patient showing a very good response. But they do have recurrence, so this uh, underlying psychiatric disorder may be one of the reasons why these patients are so prone to develop CSCR. So the conclusion which I laid in my this study, which the first paper and the second paper with the DAS study is that stress is relatively common among these young patients. The severity of the CSR and the area of neurosensory detachment was, was, was correlating well. Sorry. Uh, we require definitely a larger sample size to have more, uh, you know, rather than, this is just a hypothesis which we have said and we have tried it out in various patients and have had good results, but to, we should have a better sample size. And, and you can go on to DAS, 41 score is also there, which is a more complex, uh, you know, nomogram where you can study yourself, sort of. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. But my question is, uh, only anxiolytic, or do you need some epilenolone like drugs? Yeah, so actually, sir, what the epilenolone drug also is like a anti uh, mineral corticoid drug you know yeah so the here we are thinking that the corticosteroids are the main driver as i showed you the stress leads to this mm -hmm. so these anxiolytic drugs are working to reduce the glucocorticoid level yeah. because it increases noradrenaline also is what has been shown in these patients you know mm -hmm. due to the st high stress levels so i have not done epinaloron in my patients sir mm -hmm. they've only received anxiolytics which maybe is only anxiolytics on, yeah which okay. is work week maybe working on the glucocorticoid pathway is what the hypothesis is but the sample size is small i think you know yeah. But clinical experience has shown very gratifying results because in acute CSR, we don't have any treatment to these patients, you know. Yeah. So this is one thing which we have done clinically also. We've done everything empirically. <laughs> yes, sir, yes. Yeah. But this, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah actually, uh, with the DAS score, yes. can you tell a patient the psychiatric? Yeah, so no, that, that's what, so we didn't want to. If I get a CSR tomorrow before going to OT, I will get damn first time my DAS score will be 24. 24, yeah, right, right. No, so what we had, what we did, no, so this was the second part of the study. The first part, as I showed you all, we had referred this patient as a double-blind trial to the psychiatrics. Okay. And after that, we decided to compare that whether the severity of the CSR correlates to the severity of the stress. Like, you know, you can have either anxiety yeah. or you can have depression or you can have stress, you know, the three gradation. So this DAS score is quite a intensive score, you know, which has... Actually, yeah, actually what, you know, we did the DAS score and then we sent them to the psychiatrist also and they started the anxiolytics in this study also, the response. Okay. I didn't start. But in my private practice, after this study, I'm, I'm giving my patients at least a mild anxiolytic when they present to me. Was this causing CSR or CSR is causing CSR? Say it's a vicious circle. So I've seen that initially a stress will precipitate CSR and then later on a chronic CSR becomes the major stress in his life because his arthritis has some monetary problems and then the vision loss is becoming a secondary problem. So I think it's a vicious circle which you can break with this drug. Thank you, sir. Thank it's you. It's a very Thank good you. presentation. Thank you. Now I call upon Dr. Chirag so AB. Economically viable if we use the anxiolytics. Yeah, it is. 
वो जो दो Yeah, we didn't. We we didn't do that study actually of uh, you, you know measuring the glucocorticoid levels, but that has been done in various studies. Okay. They have been utterly published that there is a higher level of glucocorticoids in these patients levels in these patients with CSCR. So psychiatrist, our patient won't eat. Sir, sir, that's what. So, so this was. I just. I, I no. I wanted to tell you this was. No, this was done in a tertiary medical college. Yeah. So we have a ophthalmopedy and a psychiatry opedy just nearby. So it was done in a medical college. Yeah. In private, I'm not doing it, frankly, to tell you, sir. <laughs> I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. So you know that, you, you know what got me thinking is the uh, Lawrence Yanuzi's article. If you read, no, there is an article which he has said. So that's why I took it to the next level, and we found results, you know, in my clinical patients, clinically. Sir. Require more cases. Yes, I definitely require more cases. Yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I call upon Dr. Chirag Abi. Dr. Chirag Evi, are you present? So I'm calling the next person. Dr. Ali's, Dr. Alisha Elizabeth Alex, are you present? Okay. Your topic is crisis of uh, compliance, understanding the paradigm of uh, treatment of dropouts in diabetic retinopathy care. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My topic is crisis of compliance, understanding the paradigm of treatment dropouts in diabetic retinopathy care. I'm not able to move my slide. So panretinal photocoagulation treatment for diabetic retinopathy has shown a significant 50 to 60 percent decrease in severe visual impairment risk within three months by halting abnormal neovascularization. And the introduction of anti vegf injections has had a transformative impact on managing diabetic retinopathy. So though diabetic retinopathy is mainly treatable, complications arise when patients fail to follow up cons consistently. So in this study, loss to follow up was defined as any missing as missing any follow-up visit for any interval exceeding six months, provided that the patients eventually resume care before the end of the study period. There may be several untold factors that may lead to uh, not to follow-up. However, some notable influencing factors may be affordability of the treatment and need for multiple sittings or injections. So the objective of my study was to estimate the proportion of treatment dropouts among diabetic retinopathy patients receiving anti-VEGF therapy multiple laser sittings within one year of starting the treatment. And it, the second objective was to explore the factors associated with the treatment dropouts among these patients. Uh, it was a prospective interventional follow-up study conducted in a tertiary care hospital uh, in Kolar uh, over a period of one and a half uh, years. And all diabetic retinopathy patients undergoing anti-VEGF treatment or laser treatment who presented to the OPD was uh, uh, conduct, uh, evaluated in the study. A total of 112 patients were taken. So all these patients were subjected to uh, the routine screening tests and investigations, and they were characterized in, uh, categorized into three groups. That is anti-VEGF group, laser group, and both anti-VEGF and laser group. The number of their uh, PRP sessions and the injections were assessed, and the follow-ups were uh, assessed. Here the patients, were the patients in the loss to follow-up group were requested to complete an eight-factor questionnaire through the telephonic method and regarding the reasons for their missing their follow-up appointments. The questionnaire covered various potential causes such as uh, for loss to follow-up, such as lack of information, compliance, treatment affordability, transportation issues, social support, and employment commitments. And the patients were uh, asked to respond with their, uh, to the questions with yes or no. Uh, he here, the data were analyzed as frequencies and proportions. Chi-square tests or Fisher exact test was used for significant tests of qualitative data. Uh, here, the results. Um, for, out of the 112, 78 were undergoing laser, 
22 are undergoing anti-VEGF and 12 patients undergoing both. Among the age groups or even the sexual, uh, there was no uh, statistically significance in the results. Um, he had the loss to follow up reasons. The highest came for the financial obligation that the patients had. And the second highest was for the job obligations among the working population. And the third was uh, ineffectiveness. The patients felt that their treatment was ineffective and uh, hence they did not follow up. So in the study, 30.4 patients who received PRP or intrauteral anti-VEGF injections were lost to follow up. Um, and 60% of the diabetic retinopathy patients exhibit a positive response to PRP within three months following the completion of treatment. And uh, nevertheless, one third of the patients, growth of new retinal vessels may persist after the initial PRP session. So consequently, the occurrence of vitreous hemorrhage poses a risk of vision loss and may even impede the continuation of further PRP sessions. In contrast, anti-VEGF injections can yield to rapid regression. However, uh, it may be even only for a shorter duration and new vessel can recur when 93% of the eyes within 12 weeks. So here the higher rate of the loss to follow-up was observed in subjects who underwent intravitreal injections or a combination of both than those in the PRP group alone. Uh, the study, in our study, the limited affordability was the predominant cause, and the second was the job obligations, particularly in the younger age group. There was no ideal time interval for defining loss to follow-up because the PRP or the intravitreal injection follow-up schedules can vary depending on the stages of diabetic retinopathy patients. The study did not have randomized treatment decisions, which may have introduced a selection bias. And it is essential to note that the outcomes of our research may not be universally applicable for on an international scale. So uh, to conclude, it's a crucial, it is crucial to underscore the substantial risk of vision loss faced by diabetic retinopathy patients who experience, lo who, uh, experience loss to follow. Consequently, it becomes an imperative to meticulously examine each patient's specific causes contributing and tailor the interventions accordingly to mitigate their risk. Identifying and understanding the potential factors leading to loss to follow-up can pave the way for targeted and practical strategies to enhance patient engagement and follow-up. These are my references. The slide's not moving. Thank you very much. Uh, are you giving free injections to the patients? Uh, no, sir. In this study, we had taken people who were already had started the study, but eventually they, they were lost to follow up. No, the cost may be the factor. <laughs> yes, a uh, so lot of the main cost they said was financial obligations. Yeah, that's must be. One percentage is completed one year follow up. Your total number was how much? 112, sir. No, sir. Only about 34 had lost to follow. The rest had followed up. And out of that, the major cost was financial or job obligations. What anti have you uh, given? We have given ranibizumab. Ranibizumab only. Any other question? Any other question? Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I will be call upon Dr. Rishikesh Deshpande. Dr. Rishikesh Deshpande is present. He is also absent. Our next speaker is Dr. Ruchitra Chaudhary. Dr. Ruchitra Chaudhary. She will be speaking on rearward economic analysis of diabetic macular edema and cost to maintain single line of vision. Good afternoon, everyone. Please start the slides. The topic of presentation today is real world economic analysis of diabetic macular edema and the cost to maintain single line of vision. So uh, India being the diabetic capital of world has a prevalence of 5.6% of sight threatening diabetic retinopathy. So there are various government schemes which are now focusing on diabetic retinopathy yes, screening yes. and management, but no real world data is available to assess impact of health schemes in Indian eyes. Also, there are very limited Indian literature that has revealed increased cost care of disease severity and visual impairment. 
So our aim is to understand the real world economic analysis of diabetic macular edema and the cost to maintain single line of vision and also to assess the impact of government health schemes and community programs in diabetic macular edema care. So it was a retrospective cross-sectional observational study conducted in a tertiary care eye institute in Kolkata. The patients were divided into four groups, the first being the cash, second being the government health scheme, third being the mediclaim, and the fourth being the institutional community program group. All the patients included in the study went through equal quality of eye care as a part of uniform institutional protocol, and the cost analysis was done as per the number of clinic visits, OCT, and the treatment provided. 142 was the sample size, where the age of presentation was highest among the community support group and least in the government health scheme group. The distance from the hospital was highest among the cash paying group and least in the community support group. The duration in diabetes was highest among, again among the cash paying group and least among the community uh, support group. The duration of follow up in months was highest among the cash paying group followed by the community support group then the mediclaim group. The BCVA at final visit uh, had the uh, highest uh, number in the community support group and then the cash paying group. The central macular thickness was highest in the cash paying group again followed by the uh, government health scheme group and least in the community support group. The total number of anti-VGF given was highest among the government health scheme group followed by the community support group then the mediclaim group. The total cost that incurred over two years in mediclaim group was about 15 lakhs, whereas in cash paying group it was about 13 lakhs, and in the government health scheme it was 29,000. The functional outcome was maintained and improved in the final visit in maximum of the patients, and there was very little intergroup variability seen. So the mean cost that incurred per year was 70,000 INR for those who had mediclaim and for cash paying groups. Now we have seen that government efforts are primarily focused on cataract blindness, but few are now also focusing over diabetic retinopathy blindness. So there is no real world data available in Indian eyes to assess the outcome of interventions in diabetic macular edema. And if we now uh, talk about the annual screening of diabetic retinopathy, we spend about 42.3 billion INR every year. And if we talk about 20% of such patients who need treatment, then 2.9 billion INR is spent. And if we don't, the estimated lost economic activity per year is 472 billion, billion INR. So uh, there was only one Indian study where the mean cost incurred was 60,000 and the factors affecting outcome were grade of retinopathy, duration of follow-up, and the distance, but they did not evaluate the impact of health scheme. In our study, the cost of treatment over one year was 70,000 INR, and the maximum vision gain, maximum number of injection, and maximum duration of follow-up was in community support group and the government health scheme group. So it is important to remember that India uh, per capita income is 98,000 INR in 22-23. Whereas the current average cost of DME treatment over a year is 70,000 INR. So definitely there is a need for government and community support in diabetic macular edema care. So this provides a valuable data for policymakers to optimize government funding for diabetic retinopathy treatment because this study is underlining the real world efficacy of government schemes and community support programs. Still we have some limitations like it was a single centered retrospective study with a small sample size. And I would like to conclude with that government schemes and community support programs can definitely help the underprivileged patients to get same level of outcome as mediclaim and out of pocket, pocket patient, cash patients. And this study is definitely going to provide a framework for policymakers to allocate funding for diabetic retinopathy care. Thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. But I, uh, I know you see lots of patients there in Netherlands, isn't it? Anyway, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, it. Uh, uh, sir, community. Yeah. Uh, sir, there were loss to follow up, but what we in, uh, included in the, the uh, one of the part was in inclusion criteria that we wanted to include all uh, those patients only who have taken a tot at least a minimum nine months uh, treatment, sir. Only those were taken, sir. There were loss to follow up because be in between second uh, term of pandemic came up. So there were loss to follow ups also. Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Now I call Dr. Chaitra Jaydev. 
she will be speaking on ret retinopathy, relationship of immune factor level between vitreous aqueous serum and tears, the vast study. Good afternoon, esteemed judges and my dear friends. Today I'll share some interesting insights into research that we've conducted at Narayan Australia. We already know that 101 million diabetics are there in our country and 21 million are already at risk for side-threatening complications of diabetic retinopathy. So there is an imperative need for a definitive treatment with the least number of invasive injections. Vitreous biomarkers have already shown us that they can predict who can get the disease and what is the best possible treatment outcome for these patients. But testing the vitreous is rather risky. It's a small surgical procedure itself. So why not use something like tears or even aqueous, which is available to us when we are injecting these patients? Or better still, why not blood? You know, every other di day, diabetics check their blood for their blood sugar levels. So that's a feasible option. Which is why we came up with this bright study to look at all four samples and compare the different biomarkers that we see in these four and see how strongly they correlate in the vitreous, aqueous, serum, and tear study. We employed 22 patients who were undergoing vitrectomy for complications of PDR, and we collected all four samples on the same day as the surgery itself. This is in brief on how we conducted the study. In our in-house grow lab, we stored these samples, we segregated them, and we finally analyzed them for soluble factors such as cytokines, chemokines, ICAM, VCAM. So these are all the biomarkers that we looked at, and we looked at 53 biomarkers. We used different quantifiers because one was not able to pick up all of them, and we found the absolute concentration at the end of it. Now, what you see here is the plasma had the highest level of uh, protein content, and we used a technique called as normalization to make all four of them comparable. What you see here on the right is something called as a principal component analysis, which shows that those biomarkers that came from ocular fluids are grouping together. This gives the component of or the concept of organ-specific sampling, which I'll speak about. This is something called as hierarchical clustering. This basically shows that these biomarkers, for example, in cluster two, you see vasculogenic and immunogenic or inflammatory biomarkers, they are all grouping together. That means they are comparable across these four samples that we selected. Now, what our study showed was that close to 80% of samples, that is from the vitreous and aqueous, correlated very well and strongly. Whereas if you look at the tears and the aqueous and the plasma and the vitreous, we saw about 28% across the four samples. On the right, you see a very complex Sankey plot. This basically shows a very in, uh, interesting interplay between the combination of these different samples and the biomarkers that we studied. Now, what we are trying to show here in the red arrows are the clinically significant biomarkers that we found. And what you will see here is besides the usual suspects of VEGF and angiopoietin 2, we are also seeing a whole lot of other inflammatory biomarkers itself. Yes, we had you know, some challenges where we had to collect all four samples on the same day from the same patient, and especially across different diseases. That was a little difficult. And of course, we must understand that systemic uh, you know, wish issues will have a bearing on these biomarker profile. But testing is repeatable, and I'm sure we'll be able to find good targets and make it even personalized for our patients. This is the first study that showed a strong correlation between vitreous and aqueous with 80%. We also saw a good correlation in tear samples with the spillover that we see. Organ-specific sampling, because of that grouping that we see from ocular fluids, may be a little bit more reliable from other body fluids. But there is definitely a role for surrogate sampling with these minimally or non-invasive samples. Let me show you a quick example. This is a patient with diabetic macular edema, and you can see the response after anti-VEGF. Patient was not very happy. We looked at the aqueous that we had collected at the time of the first injection. You can see that the VEGF levels are very, very low. Intuitively, we switched the patient to steroids, and you can see a fantastic response. Now, imagine this other lady. She's come to you. She's very, very scared of injection. She's like, doctor, I need just one or two. Please cure me with just that much. Now, this is her biomarker profile. When you look at this, you'll say, why don't you try steroids? She might respond, VEGF again is low. Lo and behold, we did go ahead with steroids and look at the response, fantastic. Now imagine the situation that this patient, this biomarker profile, you got even before the first injection, and that too non-invasively, either from her tears or from the blood. Won't it just be fantastic? So friends, the future is bright. We are on the brink of personalized medicine, personalized or bespoke ophthalmology, where there's a non-invasive biomarker that is repeatable and can help not only monitor progression for our patients, but can also predict which is the best treatment for our patient, thereby increasing their compliance to treatment. With that thought, thank you very much, and I acknowledge my team. Thank you very much for your nice presentation.
any questions from the judges or uh, audience 22 patients we had more but the sample source was adequate for testing only in 22 of them because sometimes the tears uh, from the Sharma strip was not adequate uh, you are further doing studies to uh, see for more biomarkers yes sir in fact we've already designed a biomarker kit which is presented in other papers wherein we are able to do it as point of care you don't even have to send these samples to the lab anymore you collect it in the clinic it's like a dipstick test you know which makes it so convenient then and there we are able to already tell whether this patient is going to respond or not at our institute we've already done it for dry eyes and we've got good results now the process is on for diabetics as well you know if you can just tell them from their blood sample i think that would be the easiest but like I mentioned, probably the ocular fluids are going to be a little bit more specific than uh, testing plasma, which has a high concentration of proteins. So with the tear sample or the aqueous, if you can tell them that this is your drug, anti of or steroid, I think it is going to be not only cost effective, but the patient will also be definitely more compliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much all the presenter, judges and all the audience for their invaluable time. Now I request the, all the one presenter more. and judges for the group photograph. One no, more just a one. Uh, Dr. Chirag is there? No, she's not, he's not here. Dr. Chirag? Absent. Oh. He was absent at the time. Uh, you, were, you were absent actually. <laughs> he was absent at the time. I had written the absent. Didn't he just have <laughs> okay, okay. tossed it out and then... Okay, okay. Okay. Please start your presentation. Okay. He'll be talking on subclinical central macular thickness and total macular volume with SDOCT and its correlation with HB1C. It's not starting. No, this is not. Uh, ah, Kim. No, this is not my topic. Just click there. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. There's no financial interest or uh, any conflict of interest with this study. So coming to introduction, diabetic mellitus stands out as a prevalent microangiopathy exerting a multifaceted impact on various organs. Among these complications, diabetic retinopathy is a common microvascular complication. Glycosylated hemoglobin is a crucial marker for long-term uh, glycemic control. Uncontrolled hb one c levels have been associated with DR, characterized by macular edema, neovascular uh, hemorrhages, and ischemia. DME is a major cause of uh, visual loss in diabetes. And a large body of research has linked the frequency of clinically diagnosed DME to the intensity of DR. Nevertheless, there is a lack of data on how often a subclinical DME occurs and how severe retinopathy is. OCT is a more sensitive than uh, clinical examination alone in detecting subclinical <laughs> diabetic macular edema and proving the existence of a preclinical stage of this maculopathy would be very helpful in alerting diabetes to the need for better glycemic management and offering them early warning indications. So the objective of a study is to evaluate differences in central macular thickness and total macular volume between diabetic patients without diabetic retinopathy and di non-diabetic individuals and to establish connection between CMT, TMV and HbA1c levels. Material method. Uh, it's a cross-sectional analytical study conducted in Al Jalwa Hospital in uh, rural Karnataka, India. Uh, participant included diabetic patients without diabetic retinopathy and non-diabetic controls. So our inclusion criteria included patients who are more than 40 years of age, where cases are those who are clinically diagnosed diabetic mellitus for more than 10 years, either type 1 or type 2, without any evidence of diabetic retinopathy. And controls are age and uh, gender matched non-diabetics were taken as controls. Our exclusion criteria included hypertension and other related systemic disorders, high myopia patients, posterior segment pathologies, previous ocular surgeries, and hazy media. Following obtaining consent and ethical clearance for both cases and controls, standard procedures were performed, including uh, visual assessment, anti-segment examination with slit lamp, fundoscopy, IDO, and 90T spectral domain OCT imaging and serum HbA1c level estimation. Uh, images with quality score of more than 20 delivers were selected for analysis. CMT and TME will be measured with the CMT representing the average macular thickness and TME the volume of within one millimeter of the macular foia, where macula was divided into nine quadrants and the volume TME was cal calculated. P-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. 
Our results showed that uh, take 80 patients and 80 study consisted of 80 cases and 80 controls, which are age and uh, gender matched, where it showed that the CMT and the central macular thickness was uh, statistically significant between cases and controls. Similarly, with between the total macular volume was also, the, the, it was uh, difference was statistically significant. Uh, there's a positive strong co correlation was found between HbA1c level and central macular thickness, and a positive moderate correlation was found between HbA1c level and total macular volume. In the discussion, our study explores the relationship between glycemic control and diabetic retinopathy, emphasizing the role of optical coherence tomography in detecting subclinical diabetic macular edema and glycosylated hemoglobin as a marker for long-term diabetes ma management. Our study and related su research suggested a temporal sequence of ocular changes in diabetes, supporting the importance of early intervention strategies. A study by Gobel et al. demonstrated the precise measurement of uh, retinal thickness using uh, standard domain OCT, affirming its reputability. This parallels our study's aim to evaluate macular health in diabetic individuals without overt retinopathy. And this study, inference study, read by Sugimato et al., show, supports the reliability of HD OCT in detecting early retinal damage. It explores OCT's potential for early diagnosis of diabetic alteration in type 2 diabetes patients without retinopathy, aligning with our focus on subclinical changes and uh, emphasizing the importance of proactive diabetic eye care. A study by Ling Yung et al. indicates a positive correlation between chronic HPNC levels and macular volume as well as macular thickness in individuals with diabetic mellitus lasting 10 years or more without diabetic macular edema. These results suggest that macular hemodynamic alterations may precede the clinical manifestation of diabetic macular edema. Furthermore, the observed macular changes in these patients are likely attributed to the long-term impact of hyperglycemia. So the conclusion of our studies, our interest suggests that the changes in TMV and CMT may precede obvious symptoms of diabetic retinopathy, indicating a potential link between subclinical macular changes and glycemic control. Our findings underscore the need for early intervention strat strategies, advocating for a comprehensive approach to diabetic management that recognizes early ocular manifestation as a crucial indicator. OCT plays a crucial role in the management of subclinical DME by enhancing early diagnosis, monitoring disease progression, and optimizing treatment approaches to preserve vision and mitigate the impact of diabetic retinopathy. The limitation of the study is a small si sample size and the lack of follow. Thank you. Is Dr. Rishikesh Deshpande is there? Dr. Rishikesh Deshpande? Oh, now, now we are just sum up the session. So I request, thank you very much for all the presenter. Now I request the, all the presenter and judges, uh, please come for the group photograph.